Hello listeners and welcome to this week's episode of The Cult Vault. This week we have special guests Caroline Cole and Rebecca Mellinger from the new podcast Trapped in Treatment. Trapped in Treatment is an in-depth look into the troubled teen industry brought to you by Paris Hilton, iHeartMedia and Warner Brothers Unscripted TV. If you haven't yet, head on over to wherever you get your podcasts and subscribe today to learn all about a different troubled youth program each season with expert-led coverage on why and how this industry is able to exist, real-life survivor testimonies and the legal activism and reform happening right now to tackle this ongoing institutionalised abuse of the youth of America and the world. To coincide with the release of this episode, I will be releasing another Troubled Teen Industry interview with a survivor of French Camp Academy Mississippi tomorrow. As usual, the business includes 10% off CrimeCon UK tickets by using the code COLT at the checkout of crimecon.co.uk. The Ally Awards are still open for nominations on my website, as well as the Cult Vault merch store at cultvaultpodcast.com. And you could be the lucky winner of Mary Mahoney's Abnormal Normal, My Life in the Children of God, this month's monthly memoir giveaway book. Just head on over to at Cold Vault Pod on Twitter and Instagram and follow, like and comment on any of my content across February to be automatically entered into the draw. Now, on to the show. Here are your co-hosts, Caroline and Rebecca. So hello ladies and welcome to the show. Thank you so much for joining me today to bring attention to your new podcast, Trapped in Treatment, brought to us by Paris Hilton, London Audio, iHeart Media and Warner Brothers Unscripted TV. And as listeners will know, we have talked at length about the troubled teen industry on this show already and the institutionalized abuse that happens across these troubled youth programs and so-called schools and programs and all the other stuff that we've already mentioned. But today we're going to be discussing some of the activism that is taking place against this industry. So would you like to start by introducing yourself to the listeners? Absolutely. And thank you so much for having us. We're very excited to be here. This is Caroline. I'm one of the co-hosts of Trapped in Treatment, and I'm also one of the co-CEOs of uh, Unsilenced. And I'm Rebecca Mellinger. I'm the other co-host of Trapped in Treatment, and I am Paris Hilton's impact producer as well. It's so exciting for me to sit down and chat with you both. I've just listened to the the four episodes of Trapped in Treatment that are available for the public to listen to right now. By the time this episode comes out, there may be one or two more episodes, but it's such an interesting concept to, to, to take and put forward to the public. And I'm sure we'll get into this a bit more as we go. But what I found interesting so far is that there are all elements and angles of this industry that are being explored in the podcast that include people that not only are speaking out against their own experiences or experiences that their loved ones have had whilst involved in in one of these programs or some of these programs as we know some people attend kind of more than than one or two but you've also got people in the podcast that are speaking about services that they offer that endorse or or promote or pay money towards the industry as well so I found that uh, really really interesting it's not just one-sided it's, it's very kind of inclusive of, of all different perspectives and that to me I think is is pivotal in understanding the industry itself but also to to allow listeners to create uh, uh, and and kind of harness their own unbiased opinion of, of it. Of course, we're coming at it from an, an activist's perspective, trying to, to create change in, and a reform in, in laws and policies. But I do really appreciate the fact that you're kind of given the space for other people to author their thoughts and feelings and services that, that, that they offer in, inside the, the industry as well. So Caroline, can you tell us about Trapped in Treatment, the, the overall aims for the platform and the podcast and what people can expect from the show tuning in, aside from everything that I've obviously just kind of vomited out there? <laughs> yes, yes. <laughs> I love it. So I actually, I think you brought up a really amazing point because, uh, you know, even when we were creating this podcast, I was listening to certain points that were made and you can ask Rebecca, I called her and I'm like, oh my God, we can't say this. This is going to upset people. 
school. This is, you know, and I would kind of go through these moments of panic and Rebecca would reassure me. She's like, wait, no, we need to like, we have to tell both sides. This may not be something that we necessarily agree with, but as people learn about this issue, they naturally have questions that come up. And so we hope through, you know, providing both sides of the argument that we can answer some of those questions and we can create more room for conversation. So when we first started developing, you know, what was going to be the overall arc of the show, um, you know, what were we wanting to communicate? We really wanted to take people through that experience of being a young person who's admitted to a facility like Provo Canyon School. So throughout this series, we walk you through everything from the intake process and what what that's like going into solitary confinement and what that's like in the facility. Um, You know, we share a lot of survivor stories throughout that experience as well. And then what happens when you're released and afterwards and what's life like now for so many survivors. Um, And so Rebecca also had the opportunity to interview a lot of professionals that was really eye opening. So I'll give her a moment to speak about her experience. But yeah, it's a really, really awesome, awesome production. And that's what's so exciting about the two of us co-hosting this together is that we do come at it from different angles. Caroline knows this industry from, you know, the front and the back of her hand, she has lived it. Um, And so she can really viscerally understand it. And for me, I was introduced to this industry about two years ago. And so it's not only a learning opportunity for me as I speak to experts and psychologists and people who are engaged in the industry like that transport woman, um, but having kind of that investigative outside look as well as the really internal personal look offered us the opportunity to connect with, you know, guests that we had on the podcast at various times. But I do think that the experts that we had on the show really do provide that wholehearted look at the industry, which is so important because we're not just trying to yell out our own personal views about Provo Canyon scores, the the whole industry, just like you said, you nailed it on the head. Um, We're trying to have people question their own thoughts about it, their own views on, you know, why do we engage in this type of activity for troubled teens? Should we think of the word troubled teens differently and so forth? And that absolutely comes across in in the content and the episodes. And I'm excited to kind of hear the direction that the show continues to take because we we hear in episode one that that season one is going to be specifically focused around Provo Canyon School and that then, you know, other seasons will focus on on other programs, uh, schools, uh, whichever kind of label uh, the specific uh, program has. And the interviews that I've done with CDU survivors specifically speak to the absolute horrors that take place at, at, at Provo Canyon School and how that was almost used or, or often used even as a threat against CDU residents, I say in, in inverted commas, if people were still going by the, the impossible rules that were laid out by the staff. In, in CDU specifically, they were threatened with Provo Canyon School because everybody had heard about how awful that particular place was, which is so difficult to comprehend if you're familiar with, with this industry because CDU itself was such an awful place to be. So how much worse does it have to get for that to be used kind of as a, as a, as a threat of punishment against the residents? Well, interestingly, that was actually Paris's direct experience. So Paris went to CDU ascent and a few others um one other as well and she was told you know if you continue to run away if you are bad here you are going to Provo Canyon school and of course as we all know ultimately that was the case for Paris as well so that's really interesting that you've spoken with other survivors who had that exact same experience there was actually one uh one young person I spoke to called Jenny who who went to ascent with Paris Hilton and remembers being in that program with her at the same time and and that particular program I believe it was um, a a shorter program before she was then taken to Rocky Mountain Academy Uh, it was she was only 12 years of age very young and her older brother was the person who had been um difficult for the parents in in managing his behavior or or understanding how to help him and and Jenny really wasn't showing any of the same signs of being that type of 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 child uh, pushing boundaries and and kind of breaking parental rules and things like that but she 
was still sent on to to uh, to be a part of this industry and their their kind of brother sister story around that is really heartbreaking but really insightful as well in in sort of like uh, how some levels of dependency are almost created for parents and, and caregivers in terms of finding some level of support for their children and managing behaviors um, effectively or positively. And that's something that we've discussed at length on this show. And I'm sure, you know, uh, as, as four episodes turn into 10, turn into 50 with Trapped in Treatment, we'll see so much more of that coming through as well. So Caroline, you spoke in the first episode of Trapped in Treatment that you are actually, in fact, a survivor of this industry yourself. And I wondered if you could just give us some details about how and when and why this happened to you particularly. Absolutely. I would love to. So the facility that I went to was called the Academy at Ivy Ridge, and it was located in upstate New York. And it was actually a spinoff of Provo Canyon School. So there was a man by the name of Robert Litchfield, and he was a dorm parent at Provo Canyon School back in the 80s. And there's different accounts of him at Provo of, you know, different students thinking of him as being very like emotionless and almost kind of like a dictatorial figure. You know, this is documented in um, several different uh, news outlets. Um, And so he went on to create an organization called WASP, which was the Worldwide Association of Specialty Programs. And they had facilities everywhere from Jamaica to Czech Republic to Samoa to, um, and and then of course, all throughout the US, right? And so, you know, just like Provo Canyon was the threat at SeaDo, we had a facility in Jamaica called Tranquility Bay. And that was where we were always threatened to be sent away to. If you don't, if you don't cooperate and get with the program here, you're going to be sent to Jamaica. And they would just blatantly tell us that there's no child labor laws there to protect you. And so you look at the conditions of uh, Tranquility Bay, I'll kind of go into this for a second because it's, you know, horrific, but interesting. So they showered outside in these like stalls that had just very rudimentary plumbing and that water was cold. You didn't have a hot shower. That wasn't a thing. Um, They would wash their clothes in buckets and then uh, really to eat. What I heard is it was mostly just like undercooked fish and rice. and, And that was it. So, you know, we knew and they knew that the punishment there was that there were no laws to be able to protect you. So, yeah, I um, I got sent away when I was 14. At the time, I, I really think my story is just so average. There was really nothing I was doing that was that horrific. I just kind of was talking back to my mom. We would get into arguments sometimes. I was dealing with depression and anxiety and just had mental health needs that were not really being met. And, and also that I think, you know, were not understood at that time. Like later in my life, I was diagnosed with ADHD. And I think a lot of that was what I was going through then, right? Like, why was I not finishing schoolwork while I had this undiagnosed um, ADHD? That it, it totally would have helped to understand that then, but that wasn't the case. So, you know, my mom, like so many people uh, in our you know, technology era. She got on Google. She started searching for help, um, help for my daughter, help for my teenager. She wound up at this website called Teen Help. And outwardly, it looked like just a kind of referral resource guide for parents. Um, but actually what it was, uh, is it was the marketing wing of WASP. Right. So they had this like outward facing. It looked like they were objective. It looked like they were not connected, uh, but it, it was like their marketing wing. And every single person that would contact this teen help organization would be referred to one of these facilities. And so that's what happened with me. They assured my mom that like, listen, this is a family reunification program. We are going to, you know, you guys are going to walk away from this, a new family. You're going to be so happy that you did this. If you don't get your child here, she's going to end up dead or in jail, right? So that already feeds into that fear because you're like, oh my God, they're going to die. They're going to be, you know, that, that again, feeds into those fears that are already there. Um, so I ended up being there for two and a half years. During those two and a half years, we were not allowed to talk we were at all. Um, no saying thank you, excuse me. 
making any audible noises. Uh, I couldn't even like nonverbal communicate. So I couldn't point to things or gesture or make eye contact uh, where you would know that like, you know, I'm looking at you, I'm seeing you, I'm making a facial expression that I'm acknowledging someone else is there. Uh, So everyone pretty much just looked like zombies, um, totally turned in zombies. Uh, We were in this was probably we can get into this a little bit later, but uh, we were required to do a series of different seminars. And this is where kind of like that culty style brainwash element of this program really gets in, in, into uh, highlights that through these seminars. And um, so I completed the program. I was there for two and a half years, went through every level, every phase uh, that was required, completed all of the different seminars and ultimately left when I was about 16 and a half. And what what is so problematic about how you started your story there was that you said, I feel like my story is pretty average compared to some things that people have heard. And that is so heartbreaking to hear somebody go through their life kind of just flicking away so nonchalantly trauma that they have experienced because they feel like in comparison to other people, it it, it doesn't matter or it's irrelevant or or because it's less severe again in inverted commas than what other people have experienced then then does it really matter and I wonder how many people are really experiencing that as well because outside of the troubled teen industry and further afield I feel like perhaps we live in a culture where if you know somebody always has it worse you know there's always someone worse off than you and I I feel like a lot of the time we are often very quick to dismiss our own experiences and our own difficulties because there's always someone out there that has it worse. And and that, I don't feel like that's good enough. And and when it comes to talking about this institutionalized abuse that, as you mentioned in in one of the episodes of Trapped in Treatment, like 120,000 people yearly go through these programs. How is that? That's not okay. And it's not okay to dismiss any one experience, even if people come out of these programs and say that it was beneficial for them. It it doesn't matter kind of which scope it's approached at or from. It's not it's not okay for people. And 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 is that again a symptom of the abuse that people have experienced for them to just say, well, my story is not important. Mm-hmm. And does it come back to all of those, all of those totally. s- systematic kind of as you said culty approaches that were used and, and kind of make you start to doubt yourself and 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 whether those experiences were severe enough to mention to other people and then you get to kind of gaslighting yourself because of those systematic approaches totally yes yes and i think that's actually one of the biggest issues in our survivor community is we absolutely do gaslight ourselves because we're like well you know i didn't have it as bad as uh you know there was a a facility in new york called the family foundation school and they would literally put you in something called the box and they would roll you up in like a rug or like a thick blanket and they would duct tape you and they would put you in it almost looked like a coffin a box in the basement of this facility and so you know there's a a, a, even another facility in in Mexico uh, that was a sister program of mine and it was called high impact and you know they were keeping kids in dog cages like literal out in the hot sun in dog cages and uh, so inside edition actually did like an expose Uh, of this facility. And so they have kind of aerial shots of uh, helicopters that were, you know, flying around this facility. And so they have images of these kids just out in the sun uh, in in these dog cages. And, you know, to think that parents were paying thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to have their kids be treated that way. It's horrifying. It is horrifying. And it's horrifying, I suppose, for you to think about those kids in those cages and be able to kind of apply it to your own lived experiences. But then as somebody from outside of this whole thing altogether, for me to think about my own children being put into an environment like that is is, is it's extremely triggering. And I feel like maybe that's where more of the empathy and understanding needs to come from is if we don't experience or understand this industry firsthand, or any high demand groups or cult-like groups, perhaps there is a way for us to empathize in how we can apply it to how it would affect us if it was to happen to us. So thinking about 
those poor kids and you in, in kind of just brushing off your experiences like they, they didn't really matter when they did is so important. And I just kind of had a little roundup of, of thoughts to go through of other points you made before I asked Rebecca some things. But what you said there about how the WASP programs were created, it's come to light through the interviews that I've done with other survivors of various programs and schools that it's a very incestuous industry. It seems to be that somebody will go to Synanon or work directly with Charles Diedrich and then work with him off the records, or maybe one day there'll be some hard evidence or paper trail, or maybe there even is by this point, that says, oh, that person worked with Charles Diedrich to actually set up CDU, and then from there, kind of all these other programs broke off. And even what you said there about how a resident of of one of these programs went on to create WASP and it's almost as if this, the residents that come I don't like to use the word indoctrinated but the the students or, or residents or participants or unwilling participants or hostages or I, I've, I've heard all different manner of words used to describe a, a person that is it that is going through one of these programs sometimes they then go onto the payroll and then sometimes once they're on the payroll they take what they learn from being employed in one of these programs to open up their own program and so actually it's as if it's a very contained industry in the in the way that it works in 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 some of the cases that we've heard then to be threatened with being sent over to another country where there's no child labor laws when there is so much that already needs to change in the country that you're existing in in terms of like law and policy is I can't even begin to think about how in these programs that don't exist in a, in a humane or, a way already to then threaten you to go to a, a country where there, where there are no laws. It already feels like you're in that place. So that, that again, is, is so difficult to, to think about when we're talking about children. And then for your poor mum to go on the internet and to look for help online and to be directed into this media marketing campaign that looks so good and has positive reviews and and you know the troubled teen industry is a multi-billion dollar industry so it's going to look so great however you look at it and 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 now I think people are getting more savvy with how they use the internet and research things but you know scrubbing still happens information is still removed so outwardly as you said it looked great but then you go to this place and you're not allowed to talk and your basic human customs are stripped away from you how is that showing you how to be a correctly functioning person in society the efficacy of these programs comes into question with the methodologies used every single time every single time we have one of these interviews I I always wonder what is the point behind the treatment because the treatment is the abuse and the abuse doesn't work so it's it's another strange one and and I do have this kind of habit of going off on tangents but it, there were so many things you said kind of in your own personal story that, that that spoke out to me. And I just um I just wanted to kind of highlight some some of the things that you said. And actually, I've spoken to Andrew, who who wanted to highlight specifically reintegration into typical everyday life and how there is no support in place for that and how he found it so hard to adjust to typical life after being in one of these programs. And Zach Bonnie said the same thing when I spoke to him about you know, his time at Sidhu and his memoir, Dead Insane or in Jail, where he spoke about how there is nothing, there are no tools, there, are, there, there is nothing in place, you know, sure, 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 sure. under government legislation that, that is there to help kids back into to, to society, you know, because by that point, they're supposed to be fixed. So it's, it's really hard to, to think about how, what that would look like. But um, it, it's another conversation that I'm sure you you have had at length. <laughs> yeah, of course, of course. So, you know, to address one of the first things that you mentioned was just kind of the like incestuous nature of this industry. Um, you know, when I was first exposed, when I was exposed by, you know, being sent there, I realized that, oh my gosh, most of these staff members are related and definitely the owners are all related and family. And even across the different schools, you would have, uh, you know, your uh, brother running one program and then the brother-in-law running another program. And it always kind of seemed like the men in the family were the ones who, and, and this is what I've heard, 
is that uh, they were almost like gifted facilities as kind of like a rite of passage. And so it was, um, you know, gifted to, to people in, in this one particular family, in my case, with the program that I went to, um, uh, you know, just, it, it's, it's horrific to think that you would take someone who's, let's say, been an electrician their whole life, they have no knowledge of children, they have no knowledge of mental health, and, and they're just gifted this facility of kids who have um, needs that are, are just obviously not being addressed. And so, you know, what's especially scary is that uh, we then see those very family members sprout off, they open up different facilities, they go to a different state, uh, they then have children, their children then inherit these facilities. And that's what we're seeing right now. So relatives uh, to some of the people who ran my program are currently operating facilities in Utah, in Nevada, like they're still very much alive and well. And these are the people who were knowledgeable back in the 90s of kids being kept in dog cages. And here they are still operating facilities. I mean, so one of the things that our organization Unsilenced is working on is creating a database so we can start to track those affiliations. Um, that information is not formally kept anywhere. And so we're creating it. Um, so, you know, that's one thing that's just magical about our survivor community is like how much work we've put in to investigate, to document, to make sure that the story is being told. Uh, so that will be public information, hopefully before too long. Uh, but then in relation to, you know, talking about the success rate of these facilities, I heard somewhere, uh, and this was through a WASP program, that there was like a 4% success rate. And even then I question how they even got that data. Uh, 4% even seems high to me, to be honest. <laughs> uh, and so, but we have to ask ourselves, like, what is our goal? When we send a child to a facility like this, what is our goal? Are we wanting them to heal? Are we wanting them to be holistic, happy people? Or are we wanting them to be compliant? Because that's what we learn, unfortunately, at facilities like this is to be compliant at any cost. And so then you have kids who are coming out of these facilities who end up in controlling abusive relationships without seeing the warning signs because they've been taught to comply, not necessarily to be holistically healed in any kind of way or to even have mental health treatment. So that kind of falls back onto the issue of what is treatment, what is therapeutic, there's no legal definition, which means these facilities can continue to claim that that's what they're providing. And I think that question there about what is it that the programs are trying to achieve, whether it's what they have said they will achieve on paper to the, the, the families that, 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 they are, that, that they are working with, um, as opposed to what the true intentions are of the programs, maybe they're the same thing, maybe they're not. It would be really interesting to know and understand what those aims are. And, uh, and perhaps they are 100% successful in those aims if they are trying to achieve something that we just aren't aware of, that we just don't know about. In my opinion, I would say if they're trying to traumatize as many people as possible, then they probably do have a 100% success <laughs> rate. But that that is just my opinion from... <laughs> That's just kind of what I have uh, come to understand through the interviews that we've done at length on this podcast. To even go a little bit deeper into that, which is fascinating about the success rate of these programs, is that we know that programs like Provo Canyon School and all other facilities with the, within the troubled teen industry are putting out these very deceptive marketing tactics. And what we saw with Provo Canyon School, it was either 2020 or 2021, they put out this report that they actually had a 100% success rate at their school. Yet on our podcast, as you will learn, uh, we had survivors from 2021 who detail horrific examples of abuse and neglect. So what's actually coming out in terms of how the survivors feel is not being replicated in terms of how the facility then markets to additional parents or um, agencies or anything like that. Um, and it can go even deeper. I mean, there's this university in the United States that does research 
with one of the main organizations um, that's basically like a club of facility owners. So they are doing research on the efficacy of these programs, but they're directly intertwined with the facilities. And as we know, these facilities' main goals are to increase their profit and continue their business. So it's just completely counter to uh, you know, child care and safety and what they actually need. I have had one or two people reach out to me and say, I don't agree with the people that you've had on your show. I don't agree they are survivors and that they shouldn't call themselves that because they haven't survived anything because the programs worked perfectly for me. And I can respect and appreciate that. And I'm glad that your family didn't pay thousands of pounds for you to then have to go and spend thousands of pounds of your own money to be fixed from trying to be fixed in the first place. It's reassuring to hear that there are people that haven't suffered at the hands of these programs, but the amount of people that come forward and say that they have is a clear indication that something isn't right. And and there is proof of this. There is proof in documentary footage, in photos, in firsthand accounts, in people with high celebrity status like Paris Hilton coming forward and saying this really happened to me and somebody with that status can't come forward and say those things if they're not entirely true because there will be people that went through those programs like Jenny who went through the program Ascent with Paris Hilton who could come forward and say that's not true none of that happened and that isn't happening actually what has happened is quite the opposite where people are rallying together and saying do you know what that happened to me and even though I may have felt at the time or a few years afterwards, that my experience was not as significant as others. In fact, actually it was. And together, all of that momentum is creating huge shifts across America and further afield. And it's so exciting and empowering. And I can't wait to see where it goes and what happens. And I feel like this is a really great segue into my first question to you, Rebecca, about you mentioning that you are Paris Hilton's impact producer. And I wondered if you could tell us what this means and how you came about finding yourself in this position. Sure. So I was actually working in the entertainment industry in front of the camera as an actor for many years. Um, And I just realized that I wanted more agency in terms of how I could tell, create, and distribute impactful stories. So I started dabbling in the documentary field and came across this incredible field of impact producing. And the primary responsibility of an impact producer is to maximize a film's potential for social impact. So that looks like partnering with additional organizations to get the word out about a film, to raise awareness of the specific issue, to fundraise for impacted communities, kind of the list goes on and on. And what's so cool about it is that it actually changes based on the subject or the issue area within the film. And so it really offers the opportunity for impact producers like me to become so knowledgeable and deep dive into so many important areas as you continue to get new jobs. Um, And really, you know, it's the way I found out about the troubled teen industry and and I will never look back and never not be a part of this given obviously all we know about the harms of it. But I joined Paris as her impact producer when her documentary, This Is Paris came out, which today it's actually been seen by over 46 million people on YouTube, which is an incredible number given just what you just said about how survivors are watching it. They're utilizing the film to um, feel validated themselves. They're using it to speak to their own family members to help describe uh, what they experienced. And obviously we're using it in terms of legislative change and further awareness and and reform. So that's how I found myself in this position and, and it's been quite a ride. You said there that this is how you kind of stumbled upon and discovered that the troubled teen industry actually exists. Uh, what were your first thoughts and reactions when you were learning about uh, what what happens and 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 not that it just happened to to Paris and kind of a few decades ago, but actually Provo Canyon School is still open. Exactly. So the first two weeks of the job, I just spoke to survivors for 10, 12 hours a day, because it was really important to me to get a holistic view of what is the industry, what have all survivors experienced and the like. And when I, when I started talking to people and realizing that in high school, they were getting taken in the middle of the night, it sparked this memory 
that I had back from high school where kids would get taken in the middle of the night and you'd go to school and the kid wouldn't be in class the next day. And the, the teacher would just be like, they're, you know, they're going off to deal with some mental health. And it was so normalized, normalized to the point that we didn't ask questions back then. And so when I started talking to survivors and understanding their experience with transport and what they went to in facilities in Utah or Missouri or Colorado, you know, basically everyone, everywhere in the United States, I realized that I actually had known people that have been impacted by this. And when I started with this advocacy work, um, people from my high school actually did reach out and said, you know, I never spoke to anybody about this in my community, but I'm so, I'm so glad, you know, to know you and, and to know that you're working on it. So yeah, it's, it's a, it's a crazy industry. I mean, anybody who's listening here um, has an interest in learning more and, and advocating against it. And so um, that's really all you can ask is to continue to, to look into it. Uh, you really can't get around, especially Provo Canyon School. There's a lot of information online. Um, you can't be, you kind of, you, you, everybody should know if a child is going into Provo Canyon School now, everybody needs to do their due diligence at this point. Um, and that really is the power of Paris is that now we've taken it to a global standpoint um, and, and you can't be silent. Is there any way for you to know the amount of people that are requesting information about Provo Canyon School in terms of potential places to send their children and whether the numbers have dropped? I mean, I don't know if you'd ever be privy to that sort of information, but have you heard any hints or sort of, you know, people starting to realize that something's not quite right? I heard most recently, so a family just left Provo Canyon School and we had heard from this family that the boys and the girls campus is actually now one. Um, previously, there was a boys campus, there was a girls campus, they had um, high levels of enrollment at both. So there was no room for these kids to be on the same campus. But most recently, as of 2022, I heard last week that the boys and girls are on the same campus, which indicates to me that there is lower enrollment than previously um, before, which is a really good sign. I don't have exact numbers, I don't have exact data because currently it doesn't exist and that's what we're working to change. But Caroline, if you have anything to add. That's what, exactly what I was gonna say. You took the words out of my mouth. Yeah, we've heard that these campuses are now combined, uh, which definitely shows that they don't have the wherewithal to support, um, you know, and I'm assuming this, you know, completely. So don't quote me in fact here, but I mean, it, it looks like a sign that things are starting to slow down. That's fantastic. And, and, and even if the school doesn't shut entirely, perhaps we will see some change where it, where it is needed. And yes, if this industry is in fact as linked and as incestuous as, as we believe it, it, it is, then perhaps there'll be a domino effect, a knock-on effect of other people having to actually take a look at, at what these schools and programs have had to do to accommodate and change. Maybe the, the pressure is on for others to follow suit and do the same. And, and, and that, is the, that is the bare minimum that we can hope for. And I think the bare minimum that we will see, I think there'll be there'll be much more than that in the next few years. You know, as Zach Bonnie said, the door's been knocked down now and there's no way to put it back up again. So After your experiences, Caroline, with, with kind of having your time, your two and a half years in this program, spending the next few years and trying to understand what you'd, what you'd been through, what had happened, and then hearing that there were other people coming forward to talk about similar experiences, what did that journey look like for you? So interestingly enough, I was what they would call uh, programized. I was very programized when I left the academy at Ivy Ridge, and I believed that what I had experienced had truly helped me. 
And so, you know, like you'll hear even some people today, like you mentioned earlier, that there's definitely some some people, not so much now, but uh, in in years past who felt like, no, these things were actually this place was actually really good for me. And I believed that, too. And part of why I believed it, and I'm going to quote Maya Salovitz on this. I was sitting in a panel with her and um, she said something that just like just stayed with me because it makes so much sense and I identify with it personally. Uh, But we were talking about like, why is it that some people claim that these places are actually helpful? And Maya said that usually when you go through something really horrific, you try to create some kind of meaning from it. Right. So whether you've been in like a bad car accident or you've just had something really traumatic happen in your life or maybe you lost someone. Right. I mean, how many of us try to assign that some kind of meaning? Even years later, we'll think like, wow, well, you know, that thing was really horrible. But thank God that happened, because if that wouldn't have happened, then I wouldn't have met this person or right we try to give it some kind of value and so a a lot of times that's how we feel about these facilities like wow that was really horrible but you know now I know how strong I am Uh, or we try to give it something something like that so I, I felt that way for a number of years and even people who I heard were having a hard time um processing what had happened to them, I will be totally transparent. There was a point in time where I felt like, you know what, they just need to get over it. And that was in the past. And, um, and, and, and because that's what I was telling myself. Uh, but actually what happened is a really good friend of mine, and I'm going to give her a shout out, shout out to Katie Mack. Um, she is such a pioneer and, um, you know, this was a few years ago, she had um, actually done a lot of kind of like data recovery from the facility I went to. And so she had all of these records and files and pictures and letters and just tons of stuff. And she kind of like came into our community and started showing us, you know, all of this stuff that she had recovered from, from our program. And honestly, at the time I was livid. I was like, who is this person showing us, like confronting us with all this like traumatic stuff? Like, I don't want to see members of these uh, uh, staff members faces. I don't want to relive that experience. And and it affected me so deeply uh, that I actually had like a little bit of a mental break. Uh, it, It was really hard to look at. Um, it took me back to that feeling of when I was 14, I was stuck there. I knew that I very, very easily could be there until I was 18. Um, and, and it just completely took me back. So I fell apart a little bit to the point that I was like looking at like emergency therapy. Like I was dialing up any, anybody in my town, like, can anyone get me in immediately? Like I need help. And that's when I really knew, um, from that experience that I'm like, wow, this really messed me up a lot deeper than, than I thought. Um, and so I spent a number of months unpacking, um, looking at these letters that I had sent to my mom while I was there. Uh, I had, you know, talked to my family about it, which was hard too. There was a moment where like, we all kind of knew it wasn't good, but it's hard for a lot of parents to really face that because they feel bad. And most of the time, most of the time, there's other parents who still stand by like, no, that was the right thing. And what else would we have done? You were going to die. And, 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 and they still believe that that was the right choice. Um, but the parents who are ready to face that it wasn't, it's really hard for them to live with that guilt. Like, wow, I, so I paid for my child's abuse. That's hard. I missed out on my, my child's teen years. Uh, and, and, and it harmed them. That's hard for a lot of people to face. And I can kind of see why some parents might double down, even if they don't believe that that is actually the only option they had. Um, I do understand how some parents might try to protect themselves from the same sorts of things that you've said that you experienced when you went back and really thought about and, and were were um, you were kind of ambushed by all of this kind of stuff that, that you that you had experienced and and sent your parents and and I can see why some people might say no yeah that was the right decision and that's as far as they'll let themselves go but um and and I do understand again from some of the interviews that we've had on this show that some parents really do genuinely believe that that was the only decision um and the fact that their child is still alive and breathing today where not all the children that have attended these programs tragically not all of them 
are but those ones that are the parents are like well you're still here so that was the right thing to do but we'll never know that because they didn't try a different route and they didn't try a different thing and 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 I'm sure we'll talk a little bit later on about what the right thing or what the alternative might look like if there if there is something um but it, it it's kind of confirmation bias isn't it when people are like well you're still here so it worked right you're alive at the minimum right like and I think it's like 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 is that what we're expecting out of this like they're alive I mean I definitely think sure maybe being out of your element of comfort or in your environment can be certainly be helpful in some instances but like do we have to literally subject them to cult brainwashing in order to like save their lives like are these the tre- treatment options in our nation like that's just you know baffling to me like we haven't come up with anything better than this what you said about the journaling and the letters that that you've been able to go back and read as well um i don't know if this has helped you at all rebecca in kind of understanding this industry and and um and understanding the mentality of the of the residents uh, going through these programs at the time, because it's it's one thing to speak to somebody years after they've experienced it, but it's another thing to read their diary entries and thoughts and feelings as they are actually living those experiences. And I feel like those practices that are used in a lot of these programs are actually going to come back to haunt them later down the line because. The things that the children are are writing, even if it doesn't outwardly say, because a, a lot of the time what was written about was monitored or children became clever enough to not write down things that might get them into trouble. But the fact that they were forced under duress to complete such tasks it speaks on its own to 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 some of the treatment that 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 the, the troubled youth were subjected to during their stays in these programs. I don't know if you've had a chance, Rebecca, to kind of read through any of those things or, or, or you've come across any, any accounts of people uh, writing as they are actually living those experiences. Yeah, I, you know, I have, um, and it's, it's devastating to look at, but when Paris came out with her documentary, we obviously created this platform where I was kind of this open forum where people could submit their own stories, paperwork, you know, anything related to the industry photos to us. And so that was really a huge way that we learned about the community, um, you know, and figured out what our solution-based approach to supporting the community was going to look like. So I have read a lot of it. There's also Instagram accounts that post a lot of those types of records um, and journal entries from that time just to continue to raise awareness and and use other avenues to do so. Um, I have not read Caroline's and I don't know if I will ever, (laughs) but no, I have and and it is extremely helpful. I will share mine. Actually, I want to speak to this for a second because it was such a weird experience for me going back through my journals because in the beginning, like you can see this weird transition and it like actually makes me physically sick uh, because in the beginning I was just like, I just want to be home. I just, in, in, in hearing the way that I talked at the time, like saying things like mommy, I'm like, I was a freaking kid. Uh, and, and so hearing about like, just in, in, in that beginning, there was so much sadness and heaviness. And I, um, would just write down even memories that I had. Like I so desperately wanted to be on the outside world that all I had was to just relive my experiences and relive my memories. So there was a lot of just feeling like I'm alone. I hate this. They're mean to me. I got yelled at today. This is so hard. When am I going to get through this? And then over the course of maybe like, I feel like the first six months was very much lamenting about the fact that I was there. But then you see this weird, stark transition where all of a sudden I like, like quite literally drink the Kool-Aid. Like I start um, using program language, using um, the terminology that they would use. Like, I just need to be accountable for the results in my life. And, um, you know, by my results, I have exactly what I intend. And like, you know, just all of this language that we would use. Um, And what was even worse, and I think this is the hardest part, is that I very much became one of the abusers right and that is such a hard thing to fathom especially when you've been victimized to understand that I was also in the position where 
um, I was, uh, you know, acting cruelly against other people because that's what the program wanted from me. So there were certain sections and this one, I think made me especially sick, but I, um, in our program, we had like a demerit system, um, and but they were called corrections. And so you could refer corrections to other, other students, other kids there. And that's exactly what I did. That's what was expected of you to be able to move forward. So I would have these journal entries where I would be like, I'm so proud of myself because I referred a correction to Susie Q, to, you know, Paula. I referred a correction to this person. And, 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 but my idea at the time is that like, I thought it was in their own best interest. Like I want to support them. This is literally what we would say is like, I want to support them in their excellence and I want to support them in what I know that they're capable of. And so I'm going to refer them this correction so you know I can hold them to their integrity and it just like how much I believed that at the time physically hurts me to this day we talk about this a lot on the show in terms of other groups as well and self-policing is pretty significant in inside the trouble teen industry as a mechanism for having the residents keep an eye on each other And what we've spoken about a lot on the show is how self-policing makes you more worried about everyone else around you other than those figures of authority whose intentions you should perhaps be questioning instead. So you're so worried about your own behavior and your own voice and your own actions being questioned by others, or you're so worried about what everybody else is doing so that you can offer them these corrections that you're not thinking, Why is that person doing cavity searches on 12 year olds when they come through to these programs? And what adds to it, because I remember this feeling, um, you know, and, and, and I describe it very much as being like Handmaid's Tale. Like it feels like actually I couldn't even watch The Handmaid's Tale when I when it first came out because it reminded me so much of the program. And it's that feeling of like an all seeing eye, like wherever you go, you're being watched always there's never a moment in time where you're not being watched or observed and you know that like if you step out of line for one second someone's going to catch it you are going to receive that demerit and in and again there was such this like idea of a call out culture that we actually had every day there was something called group and we'd be in group for one hour and then they would ask it like at any point do you want to call someone out right? Or you, we'd have like call outs and you'd be like, yes. And it was such a terrifying thing. Cause you're like, shit, am I going to be called out? Oh my God. And you're like, your heart's racing. And someone will say, yes, Caroline, you, I want to call you out. And so you stand up and that person will like berate you, right? Like, this is what you did. I saw you do it at this time. I want to refer you these demerits. And it's such a public thing that it was so humiliating, but it kept you in that state of fear. And it also kept you in a state where you're like, I'm going to call out other people before I can be called out. And, and, and it was just vicious. That along with some of the dietary restrictions we've heard about in programs and the sleep deprivation, where is the chance for you to relax your own mind and perhaps not consciously think about your mental well-being? Because I don't know if at those ages that we talk about, whether we would have the the cognitive ability to actually be like, I am under so much stress right now. I need to just take a step back and really breathe. You didn't even have the option to take a hot shower, which is one of the first things somebody might say, just quickly go take a hot shower or, you know, have a hot coffee or cup of tea. Those things that we might think now to ourselves when we feel stressed or anxious or under pressure or under threat, we might just say like, I just need to take a step back. Um, and we don't have those those abilities. I, I don't think, it, I don't remember having that at that age anyway. Where is the chance for your body to do that naturally on its own without you having to say, right, stop now and, and, and sit down. So if you're always worried about yourself and everybody else and the people above you and the people below you, because they do create these kind of pyramid systems in these programs, And then you're hungry and you're also sleeping outside with no sleeping bag or tent or anything in maybe like a hole in the ground that you've had to dig yourself or whatever ludicrous thing that somebody is talking about going through in one of these programs. And so that in itself, it must be extremely stressful for for the mind. And and another thing that's important about Trapped in Treatment and what your, your podcast does is that it talks about brain development and stages of development and there are stages where children are supposed to start breaking rules and push boundaries 
And it's like blindness development where children have to take risks in order to learn how to take care of themselves when their caregivers are no longer there to take care of them when they're older. So this is all completely natural brain development when, when children start pushing boundaries and breaking rules and staying out later than they should be and maybe dabbling in illegal substances, you know, with nicotine or alcohol or, or, or harder drugs or, or, or whatever that may be. And that is not unique to if, if a child is experimenting or experiencing those things, that is not unique to that child in any, in any way whatsoever. Um, and, and that is another important thing that, that your show does is it highlights actually from 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 professional research. Those those parts of, 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 of children's brain development that that do happen and and are happening and are probably so detrimentally affected by these programs when you're going go, when you're going through them to be able to not make eye contact with people and speak to people and and say please and thank you and excuse me and just those basic customs that we're taught from so I'm teaching my two-year-old to say please and thank you to then be 12 years old and and taken to one of these programs it gets me so like riled up to think about it's stripping down an individual breaking them down so that they are no longer an individual and denying that individualism and denying basic human rights like hot showers and pleases and, and, and thank yous and, and customs that you teach your kids from the moment that they can understand words. And Re- Rebecca, actually, when we were creating Trapped in Treatment, Rebecca had the uh, privilege of being able to interview some of the siblings too. And so, yeah, what I think if you want to kind of go over that for a second, I thought that was really an interesting perspective is like, how is it affecting the whole family? Yeah. Yeah. I'm so glad you brought that up. I mean, for us, for obviously we know a child is isolated then from their family. They're isolated as what Caroline is saying from everyone around them that significantly affects your developmental phase that you're in. But for a sibling whose child, who, who's for a sibling, whose sibling is taken in the middle of the night one day. And that sibling who is still stuck at home has no answers on where their best friend, sister, brother, went, um, it affects them significantly. And and we do hear from that in the podcast. Um, it creates them, you know, they're then on alert a lot of the time they're worried. Well, if this happened to my sibling, am I going to then be sent? Um, there's a distrust in the family unit for them as well. Um, and, and often, I mean, Caroline, maybe you can speak to this even further, but I feel like the, the thoughts and the viewpoint and the emotions of the sibling isn't necessarily as addressed because the, child who is in the program's needs were far greater in terms of the parent's perspective at the time. Um, so them coming to terms with all of this is, is hard as well. Totally. And I think there's even like a different dynamic that we see in families too, especially with siblings where, you know, sometimes in these kinds of families that send their kids away, uh, there's a certain, like we almost call it just like program parents. There, there can be certain types of personality types um, that have a tendency to send their kids away more. And so what that looks like oftentimes is kind of like a narcissistic personality types. And then, you know, usually the child who is sent away ends up being like the family scapegoat. And so almost everyone in the family can start kind of like finger pointing at that, at that child, um, feeling like, you know, they're, they're the, they're the problem. And so oftentimes what we see in that case, in that dynamic is that, um, that lasts a lifetime. And oftentimes those families that end up becoming fragmented, estranged, you know, they'll have the, the scapegoat who eventually just kind of creates, you know, their family by choice with either friends or other people. And, and um, you know, so those siblings can sometimes even believe that that child was the problem and that it was all their fault and that they should have just listened and they wouldn't be sent away. And that can be hard to stomach too, because it just, it destroys relationships it destroys families and that that's come across in 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 quite a lot of the discussions that we've had on the show I think in terms of the 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 difficulties that the the people at home have experienced whether that is the parents years on when the 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 child that's been through the experiences finally sat down with the parents and explained 
what has happened to them during these years of treatment, whether the parents have gone on to listen to podcast episodes or watch documentaries or, or, or watch films and, and, and say, oh my goodness, hang on a minute, I think there needs to be a conversation here, or, or whether that, that has come from people who have tried to have these conversations with the parents and the parents have shut them down and, and, and said, you know, I don't want to, to, to talk about those things. And of course, it, it's important to mention for anybody that, that isn't familiar with the troubled teen industry that phone calls are monitored and often ended if the child tries to talk about the abuse that they are enduring or the conditions that they are living in. The post that they send out to family, to parents, to loved ones is often read and monitored um, and, uh, and parents are often manipulated before any contact is made from the child. A lot of the time there's like a six to 12 week period where the child is not allowed to contact the family anyway, phone calls or letters or anything like that. And, and it's, it's, it's kind of it's said to the parents that the, the the child needs this they need to integrate into the program and it will only work your your money will will only be spent the best way and this program will only be benefit love is in the air and you know who really deserves some extra love you that's who so why not treat your brain to a much needed recharge with best beans best beans is the mobile puzzle game that lets you take a mental spa day wherever you are Immerse yourself in the world of Best Fiends, where you'll team up with a daring band of cute collectible characters to solve brain-sparking puzzles that are nothing short of absolute fun. With thousands of levels and tons of characters and exciting events added all the time, Best Fiends has all the me time you could ask for. So give yourself some extra love with Best Fiends, the perfect mobile game for those who seek to unwind. And if anyone deserves to kick back and relax, it's you. What are you waiting for? Download Best Fiends free today on the App Store or Google Play. That's friends without the R. Best Fiends. Play Best Fiends. Download free. For your child, if you do not contact them, if you, if you have those six weeks where there is no contact, and then when you do have that contact, right. they will try to tell you that they are being abused, that they are being mistreated, that all of these things are happening to you and you can't listen to them because that is just manipulation. And recently, a, a, a survivor of, a, of another program sent me the handbook where that was actually written in the handbook. So it wasn't even verbally said to the parents, it was written in the handbook and you can see it written there on paper that they're basically saying like, your child is gonna lie and try to manipulate you, but you can't listen to them. And it's almost like they are, owning up to the, the abuse and trauma that they are inflicting on, on residents by writing that in the paper and allowing themselves to be outed later on. It, 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 that, that to me was kind of wild to just see it actually written on paper. And, and with the work that you're doing, you must be coming across a lot of this, this kind of documentation. It's in Provo's documents. We, we did look through them when we were working on the podcast and, and that's exactly what it says. They really get ahead of the abuse by describing what the children are going to say is happening and telling that they're just manipulating and lying to be able to get home. But in actuality, of course, we, we find out that that's not the case. Yeah. And I think too, they, a lot of these facilities create this dynamic with parents where it's like, you know, they, they did this with my mom at least, and she'll speak to this, that they made it seem like you had your chance to parent and look at where it got you. You're an incapable parent. Uh, and, and so now we're having to raise your child because you were not good at it. So you need to believe us, right? Like in so many words, these things are kind of like implied through little comments, through the language that they use. So it's like, you don't know what you're doing. We're the experts. We have to come in and have this intervention. And so that only leads to kind of that priming for parents to be like, oh, the facility's right. I'm wrong. I need to just trust them because I'm an incompetent parent. And, and, and so they just believe that this is in the best interest of their child, especially when you have facilities who say things like, oh, we deal with this all the time. Every parent, every family goes through this. So a kind of, again, feeding into that group idea of like, well, if every family goes through this, then I need to write, and they'll say this too. You need to trust the process, trust the process. It's only going to work if you work it, right? I can't tell you how many times we'd hear that. It's only going to work if you work it. Right. So we're like, okay, like 
and, 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 and it feeds off of every parent's desire to like have their family reunited to have their child back in their lives. And, and unfortunately, again, we're just seeing that that's not what's happening. Kids are coming out estranged. They're coming out more traumatized. Relationships are fractured, broken as, as some of these young people question, you know, mom, dad, why didn't you save me? Um, And even worse now, what we see in the industry is that so many of these kids are coming through child welfare, through juvenile justice, through special education. And so they may not have the support systems at home who are going to start looking into what's happening here. Same mentality, I think, comes across in in one segment of of your show where you speak to the transport agency and the lady says, um, you know, that we handle things in a way that the parents wouldn't be able to or that the caregivers wouldn't be able to um, because the children know what buttons to push and they don't know what buttons to push with us. Um, And that to me was kind of like, well, they might not necessarily try to push buttons. And by push buttons, do you mean like pull on heartstrings or or manipulate? Um, Because if that's the case, there's already a preconception of the, the, the type of child that the transport industry is going to be dealing with. And I'm saying this all again in inverted commas that people probably can't see. So that was upsetting to, to hear. But also then the, the, the woman speaks about how this is the only option and that this is what the child needs. And I don't know, again, if that is necessarily true or if that is the case. Um, and, and again, is my very biased opinion coming through on the things that were that were said. And, and but still important to get though, those other perspectives, as I said at the start of the episode. Um, this collecting of of documents and and kind of trying to put together some kind of um, lineage almost uh, like a family tree of all the people involved Um, is there like a a place that people can come to to provide that information is is a a lot of the the interviews we've had on the show people have provided photos and journal entries that that I haven't shared personally because it includes the names and faces of other residents that were that were included so um, ethically, it wouldn't be right for me to share those those pictures and entries. But is there a place that people can come to, to, to either you, Rebecca, or, or you, Caroline, or, or both of you together to say kind of this is what I know. These were the staff that worked in the program I attended. Th- these are the journals I wrote. These are the photos of me. Is, is there a, a, a best place for people to come forward with that information? Yeah, absolutely. So we actually have a space on our website. And so if you go to unsilenced.org, there is a tab at the top that says investigations. And if you hover over that, it'll show you a little drop down menu and you can go to program archive and it's going to bring you to a map. There's a place on there you'll see where you can submit information. It will say sub- submit documents or submit records, um, but it, it will bring you to this interactive map and it's really incredible. So I want to take a second to kind of brag on this. And uh, you can hover over a state, um, click on that state, it's going to take you to a list of all of the facilities that have ever existed uh, now or in the past in that state. Uh, You can click into each facility and it's going to take you also to a very long list of documents. And we have everything from personal records, things that people have shared with us that they're like, hey, I want this to be a part of, you know, this archive, Uh, uh, you know, historical evidence as far as like rule books, um, pamphlets, marketing materials. But we also have a lot of like official public records. So everything from DHS records, site inspections, police reports. Um, you know, recordings, like anything and everything that you would want to know about these facilities, you can find in our database. So currently we have over 40,000, I believe now we're at around 50, 50,000 different documents and it's literally growing by the day. So I believe right now our next kind of phase, uh, you know, this is version one of the archive. We have version two that's coming. And um, I believe they have a, around 10,000 more DHS documents they're going to be adding. And I believe a hundred plus thousand other documents. Um, one of the things that they're working on, and this is really interesting if you're uh, interested in, you know, investigating more about this industry, um, but we're going to be making it where all of these um, documents can actually be searched. So if we were to type in the word, let's say, restraint, you would then be able to find all of the documents that contain that word 
restrained. Or let's say you're searching for a staff member, a former staff member, and you type in their name and it will pull up every document and every affiliation with any other program uh, that relates to that person. So we're very excited with that. But yeah, you can find that on our website on silence.org. And then also there's a space to submit survivor stories. Rebecca, if you want to share how to submit that. Yeah, so we have been asking people to submit survivor stories via, we had a survivor database website, but we actually just changed it to be the Trapped and Treatment website. Um, So if you go to the Trapped and Treatment website, you will find a take action page. And on that take action page, you can scroll down and you can get to a survivor database of hundreds of survivor stories, parents, old staff members who have also, you know, shared their experience with us. And if you just email, this is Paris at parishiltonentertainment.com, or you get in touch with Unsilenced, we do this work really in parallel. Um, We would be more than happy to add your individual experience to this database, which will only further help to implicate staff facilities, as well as just continue to raise awareness. And having this sort of collection of, of, of documents, Rebecca, do you feel like that is stuff that can be used actually in a legal setting to, to, to force change if people and, and institutions aren't willing to take that, that, that this kind of on this pressure on board willingly? 100%. So we use all of the information in these databases. We use the testimonies that are provided to us. We give them to legislators. They have the opportunity to read them to understand how this is impacting individuals and constituents within their own states. We use it on a daily basis with all of our policy work. It also gives us the opportunity to, you know, go to the database. If we're speaking to a representative from Kentucky, let's say, we can go into those databases, find survivors from Kentucky or survivors who currently live in Kentucky, and we have the opportunity to ask them if they want additional involvement in the movement, which as Caroline, I'm sure can speak to, and Paris certainly says is that being a part of the movement and advocating for change is really healing for for themselves and their own personal development. So we've found that really including the survivor community as a whole in all the work that we're doing in the policy setting has been super beneficial. It's interesting to hear about the the work that you are doing alongside Paris Hilton in 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 this particular advocacy space and I wonder if you can tell us how you were approached kind of to fill the position did you know Paris Hilton prior to to becoming the the impact producer and 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 kind of what your journey into it has looked like a, a little bit more um, yeah, so so I was in the documentary space, and I did know Paris and Carter uh, personally. And so when they, you know, needed support with all this, when they they were saying there's this incredible opportunity, survivors are coming out in thousands, sharing their own experience. We really need a strategy on how we're going to use Paris's voice and platform. Um, so that is how I got involved. But in the political setting. Caroline and I actually met when we were accepted to Rise Justice Labs. And what Rise Justice Labs is, is it was created by Amanda Wynn, um, who's an advocate herself. Um, She's beyond an incredible human being, but she is brilliant and she cares about all causes. And she really advocates that survivors create the policy that we need to see change in this world. Um, And so we were accepted to that and we went through a three month program that taught us how to do the political process. And that's really where a lot of this work spurred. Um, It was where, you know, we worked on that Utah campaign for SB 127 in tandem with Caroline in Paris. um, And that kind of just continued and and grew with our own passion for influencing the political process on this issue. So we've seen change in Oregon with two specific bills with Senator Gelser. We've seen change in Missouri, additional survivors were advocated there. And and we elevated that on social media in Massachusetts, a few others. Um, We even had some influence in North in Ireland. So this is really getting into the international phase. But what our next step is, is we're taking this to the federal level with the Accountability for Congregate Care Act that um, Caroline has had a huge hand in in creating herself. And we're super excited to take this to the federal level. We believe that change must happen there to impact the United States. And so, I mean, given federal campaigns are, are quite the ride, this is really just the step. We dabbled in state policy and now we're taking it to a national stage which is exciting. That is incredibly exciting. And 
I know that legal processes take uh, oh, so long and, and you're probably chomping at the bit to get things kind of going, but at the same time, you're probably overwhelmed by the amount of stuff that there is to do at the same time. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> absolutely. No, definitely. Um, yeah, we want it to go like faster, faster now, now. Uh, but Rebecca and I both have, um, you know, at certain points in time in the work that we're doing, have like called each other in tears as we're like, ah, I'm overwhelmed. Like there's so much stuff, but it's such a worthy cause. And it's so important that like giving up's not an option. Uh, so yeah, that's kind of been the journey of the past uh, over a year for us. But we're excited to see that, um you know, I, I always kind of phrase it like this is that we, our battleground is on uh, uh, several different levels. So we have one, which is absolutely policy change and, you know, creating new laws and creating regulation and oversight, but there's also this cultural change that we're wanting to create. How do we change the way that people think about young people and think about mental health and the resources that they need? Um, how do we, you know, pathologize adolescence where just this coming of age journey, we're like, there's something wrong with them. They're out of control. They're defiant. They're rebellious. Where it's like, that is being a teenager. And how can we be more accepting of that on a, a wider scale? So yeah, seeing our different levels of successes in, in both of those areas has been truly the fuel that we need to keep going. It's one thing to talk about how wouldn't change be nice or wouldn't reform be nice, but to actually be in the throes of it happening all around you must be so empowering and exciting to know that you're kind of carrying the torch for all of these people that are coming forward with their experiences and, and that you're working together with such an incredible team to push all of that information into the public eye, to make people aware of this industry. It must really be, I mean, Rebecca, I can see why you decided kind of to be in the media space and then kind of go more towards the, the kind of advocacy and activism side of things. Uh, who wouldn't want to be a part of that? It's, it's absolutely incredible what you're both doing here. I think it's very exciting. Thank you. Well, it has been amazing. And, you know, it's, how I look at it is it's a, it's a really big responsibility because it has impacted so many people. And unless we can figure out the right solution and make the change that's necessary, then it is going to continue to impact hundreds of thousands of kids. And so um, it's a really exciting, emotional journey, but it's also just this really um, big responsibility to get it right and, and to get it right in a fast, as fast as a manner as we possibly can. I just wanted to echo that. I think, I think that that weight of that responsibility too, because, you know, as, as I know, I feel this is that as I talk about my experience and, you know, I feel like I'm like echoing thousands of people. So how can I accurately represent every single person? And sometimes that's impossible, uh, but we do our best. And I think our best so far has, you know, been paying off for everyone. And that also is what we heard about, about the podcast as well is some people, you know, we're like, well, I really want you to, to do it on, on my facility because we experienced so many of the same things. And um, I would just like to say, you know, like Provo Canyon School is just the start. We created it as the first season because how notorious um, it is within just like general pop culture at this point, um, but also because it's been around since the 1970s and we have seen allegations of abuse since then all the way up to today. So it's just, it's a very good blueprint for us to um, really go through the survivor journey as well as obviously its personal connection to Paris. But um, we're very excited to continue on and continue investigating all the other types of facilities that are out there um, that extend far beyond Provo. Paris Hilton wears many hats, Rebecca, but this one particular um, hat that she wears around political activism and being an ally to fellow survivors, it is making legal change and, and, and differences in the way that we've spoken about already. 
but is there anything specifically that we should watch out for in the very near future in terms of uh, where things might be up to in the legal system at the moment or plans that are in place for, for your teams specifically aside from trapped in treatment and the stuff that, that Caroline, you're doing around unsilenced. Is, is there something in the works that we can, that we can expect to see soon? Well, first and foremost is, is the introduction of the Accountability for Congregate Care Act, which uh, Paris has really partnered with Unsilenced and an incredible coalition of organizations to push forward. So she's going to be very, very actively involved in that campaign from start to finish. Uh, and that's that's obviously a huge responsibility on its own. I think Paris has felt the great honor of representing these survivors in a national stage and, and in the media. And so she plans to continue to do that. Um, and that also extends past just the troubled teen industry survivors. She has a platform that she can utilize for change as we've, you know, as we've discussed and as we've seen over this past year. And, um, you know, whether that's children's rights more broadly or women's rights and safety, I think we'll see over the next few years a broad uh, transition in terms of really use, utilizing her platform for these areas in a significant way. That sounds exciting as well. Just that that on its own, the, the, the potential for broadening the changes outside of this industry, spilling over into others. I'm, I'm currently reading a, a memoir from an author called Heather Grace Heath, who speaks about the educational abuse that she experienced being involved in a, a very high demand religious group. The, the, the book Lovingly Abused, which we will feature on the podcast in, in a few months time, speaks about how homeschooling in itself is a form of educational abuse against children. So even kind of looking at the troubled teen industry and children being sent away to wilderness programs or therapeutic boarding schools or, or you know, again, whichever label or title this particular program has, um, being isolated and kept at home is not the answer either, uh, perhaps. So there, there's another question around that uh, that she raises in her book. So uh, if we are looking at changing children's rights, perhaps there is some space for for that to be included as well which I think would be uh which which I think would be wonderful um especially because Heather's voice as an author is is extremely compelling um and uh and 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 I know that's not what we're talking about today but it's a, another another exciting thing in the pipeline um more advocacy and more positive change yeah, you know, it is super important. And Caroline and I talk about, you know, one of the next steps after we pass this law also being ratifying the UNCRC in the United States, which like, if you think about that, we are the only country in the entire world that has not fully ratified the UNCRC, which gives children appropriate rights, like state countries that employ children in war have ratified the UNCRC and like the United States still hasn't. So um, that is kind of like an obvious next step and something that just so needs to happen. Mm -hmm. January uh, this year was actually Human Trafficking and Modern Slavery Awareness Month, which I was looking at quite a lot on the show, um, just through some social media posts on raising awareness on what, what human trafficking might look like today. Um, and and how to spot some signs and perhaps how to communicate with somebody that you might think might be involved in, in something like uh, human trafficking or modern slavery. And the troubled teen industry was actually something that I thought about uh, whilst I was kind of writing a small article um, using verbatim quotes from people that have actually experienced child labour in the movements and groups that they grew up in and were a part of. And when you hear about some of these troubled teen spaces where kids spend sometimes the entirety of, of their tenure in one of these programs digging out a tree stump or digging their own grave to take part in some weird um, rebirthing uh, practice that, that, that just seems to really only be used as another fear tactic. Uh, but, you know, the upkeep of the, the, the actual premises and the maintenance of the premises that is all undertaken by children 
in my eyes, feels like labor yeah. trafficking um, in some ways. So that it was something that was speaking out to me. Um, and then when, um, Caroline, when you mentioned the, the, the way that there are no laws outside of the US in terms of child labor um, in some parts of the world, that is absolutely terrifying. And child soldiers, that's one form of human trafficking. And, and the fact that these countries that might have children involved in, in, in frontline events where they have guns and they have weapons and they have knives and they are expected to act on behalf of the people that have control of them, for them to have the laws in place that America doesn't is like what that doesn't even... How it's does, mind blowing. It is. Yeah. It doesn't make sense, um, especially because America is supposed to be the land of the free, and th- these institutions are the opposite of of that. So what we see in the troubled teen industry is something that we describe more as being um, benefits trafficking, and so especially if you have young people who are you know entering entering the troubled teen industry through like let's say child welfare or juvenile justice, they inherently have like a, a public price tag that comes with them, right? And so they, they have that $16,000 a month payment or $12,000 a month payment that comes with that child. And so sometimes you'll have a facility who, you know, receives that child, uh, but then they make a recommendation to go to another facility. They're like, oh, well, they actually need to be at our sister facility. And and we recommend that they stay there for six months. Then that six months is up. And then they recommend another facility. And so it's keeping that uh, that incoming payment that's attached to that child within that organization's system. So they're continuing to benefit from uh, from the payment of that child. Uh, but then we also have very much situations where there's like forced labor. Uh, so Provo Canyon actually ran a, a hotel for a number of years and they had these kids working at this hotel. Um, but if you went to a facility like the one that I went to, the Academy at Ivy Ridge, um, and, and this is also extremely common, is that uh, like the owner of the program will just kind of use these kids as like their own personal servants. <laughs> so I, I went to uh, the owner of our facility. I went to his house a number of times, scrubbed his toilets, cleaned his bathroom, mopped his floors, babysat his kids. Um, you know, and I've, I've heard this a lot happen at other facilities where these kids are cleaning the owner's cars, they're, you know, just doing whatever, because part of it too, is that, uh, as a, as a, you know, student there for lack of a better term is that, you know, that if you kiss up a little bit, I hate to use that word, but if, if you do what they ask of you and you clean their house, maybe they're going to like you. Maybe that means that you're going to go home faster. And a lot of the time it's impossible to not break the rules that are put in place. It's almost like they exist to trap you or they exist so that they will be broken. Um, a lot of the time it feels, um, I don't know if there's any evidence to kind of back this up, but it feels as if those rules are in place not only for the, the the individual to be punished, but to have their stay in these programs extended so that the parents or caregivers are forced to pay more money to have their child fixed in, oh, yeah. in the way that they are promised they will be fixed. Mm-hmm. Um, so kids that are told it will only be six months are then there for 12 and then there for 24 and it's costing the parents, you know, um, five thousand dollars a month or or you know whichever wild number you want to pluck out of thin air mm-hmm. um and and that in itself it's it's like and that's why I always call it the impossible industry because everybody seems to be referring children there and they are not designed for success it seems yeah Absolutely. Rebecca, do you feel like there is a need for other countries to look at and adopt this this type of advocacy and activism outside of America and worldwide? You've already mentioned that the work is making waves in other countries, but uh, are there any other places you're aware of that could really do with looking at some of the models you're you're putting in place to, to help young people? 
That's a great question. 100%. This is a worldwide issue. Uh, Caroline and our, Caroline already talked about WASP's footprint outside of the United States, which extended to Samoa and Mexico and the Dominican Republic and you know all these types of countries. What I do know is that there's a significant p- footprint in the UK. And that's because UHS is one of the largest providers of behavioral health services in the US. And they also have behavioral health services in the UK. UHS is the company that owns Provo Canyon School. So as you listen to the podcast, you're going to better understand that they much prioritize their bottom line over patient care and safety. Um, And so, yes, I mean, it's super important that this does extend beyond the United States. We as an organization from Caroline, as well as Paris, are more than happy to Um, you know, come into other countries and work together, given our knowledge base here. Um, But there also already is amazing organizations that are doing this work. ICARS is one of them. They are focused on restraint and seclusion in schools in the UK, um, and they're doing amazing work. And we've been very involved with their fight as well. Um, But there are residential treatment facilities everywhere in every country. And 100% there needs to be reform. Abusive facilities need to be closed down. And there needs to be broader awareness across the world and that is that is one thing that that the the podcast does so well is is highlight those things and and it it, it almost in a very a gentle way for anybody that's not familiar with the troubled teen industry and I suppose it's done like that very purposefully to to make sure it's not overwhelming for people that haven't been involved I know the first time I sat down with a CDU survivor the language that they were using was so alien to me that I had to stop them every five minutes and say you're really going to have to explain to me what those terms mean and that again is not unique to to CDU or any troubled teen program but but is universally found amongst all high demand and cult-like groups uh, around the world um just the same as two people might have inside jokes um it's 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 uh, one of those things that 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 it's okay as well to say to somebody hang on a minute uh, that language is is not known to me so you'll have to kind of break that down for me um but one thing i think has has been really interesting and and i wondered if you could kind of highlight the the impact that this has had rebecca is that Paris Hilton's career to date, um, a lot of people have been quite surprised about the direction that she's taken uh, with the advocacy work. And and of course, um, that's because she has not spoken about her experiences in uh, this industry until uh, the last few years. So people might not have had any idea that she was subjected to such awful abuse. And the fact that she has come forward and has such a a high profile celebrity status, do you think that means that she is bringing along with her a a, a tirade of of fans and other people who might not otherwise think about the, the laws of America and the treatment of children and advocacy work, much in the way that we've spoken about on the show um, Kim Kardashian it, it working with people on death row, maybe bringing a whole wave of people that who may not have listened to true crime before. Um, and, and this kind of feels like uh, uh, different in what's being uh, fought against, but also similar in the way that it may be bringing uh, new new allies. listeners to, to, yeah. to yeah, new allies to the cause. Absolutely. I mean, th- this is my favorite part about the career path that I'm on is because we have this opportunity to utilize platforms where people go to, to learn and to be engaged and to, and to be entertained. And we have the opportunity to use it to educate um, in, a, in a very real manner. Um, and so, yes, I mean, Paris's platform is such an incredible place that we, we have the opportunity to be creative with in terms of how we educate audiences. Her audiences really see her and understand her and accept this piece of her story, um, which has been, a, you know, an incredible journey for her as well as to feel like she can be free um, and that she can be truthful and that, and that she always says, you know, the truth will set you free. And she really embodies that wholeheartedly. Um, and so utilizing her platform, I mean, this survive this, this podcast trapped in treatment is really not just for the survivors. It's for the general public who wants to be entertained, wants to be enraged. We hope that they have never 
heard about the troubled teen industry and that this gets their blood boiling and that they finally want to get engaged. And so while we, while we utilize the survivor community for all of our advocacy efforts, it equally takes allies who are interested and, and have expertise in whatever field they have to get involved in our fight. And Caroline, to sort of build on that advocacy work, you are also the co-CEO of a nonprofit called Unsilenced. Is that right? Yes. So it's just, it's unsilenced. And some of our handles do say unsilenced underscore now. And so a little shameless plug, go check us out. That is our handle unsilenced underscore now. And you will find that on um, Instagram, Twitter, and then on Facebook, we are at we are unsilenced. For people who are unsure if they have themselves been involved in a troubled teen industry program or for people who haven't heard of this particular industry until perhaps today or listening to some of the work that you've both been doing, what are some common earmarks or techniques used across these programs that people might be be able to identify with? Yeah, so pretty much across the spectrum of these types of facilities, some of the things that you're going to see, uh, we touched on a little bit here today, so I'll just kind of reiterate, is um, driving a wedge between the parent and the child or uh, between, you know, the, uh, let's say, the the state agency and the child. Uh, So saying things like this child will report that they are being abused. They may make, you know, claims that they're, they don't like it here and they're trying to manipulate you. So driving in that wedge uh, is one of the first hallmarks. Um, Another red flag that we notice is having to earn communication um, which just immediately, again, is just kind of sends up, sends up some red flags for us. Um, these young people should be able to have access to the outside world. They should be able to access a protection and advocacy agency um, or anyone else to report if abuse is taking place. So again, what is their level of access? Um, we also see a big red flag being um, like points and levels, using a points and level system uh, where the child or young person has to gain points in order to gain levels, in order to earn their way home. Um, And that almost immediately will tell you that this is not therapeutic because there's no uh, markers as far as like, you know, have they started to um, recover from their trauma, right? It's nothing about that. It's all based off of points, levels, compliance. Um, We also see a big red flag being um, the usage of physical restraint or solitary confinement. Now what they will say, they're, they're, first off, these facilities are never going to say like, oh yeah, we use solitary confinement. They'll never say that. What they will say is like, oh, well, we have a chill room where they can go and hang out or they have, um, you know, kind of like a, a safe space or things like that. But any of that can be used in a way that feels much more like solitary confinement. Um, so I would say that those are the hallmarks. One other one that I would like to add is the length of the program. So we really want to refrain from any kind of uh, placement outside the home that's longer than 60 days. So if you start seeing things like 90 days, six months, a year, there's no therapeutic evidence that that shows that that is uh, effective at all. In fact, it shows the opposite, that it's extremely harmful for these young people to be displaced like that uh, for that long of a period of time. At this point during the interview, we said goodbye to Caroline so that she could go and spend time with her family. Thank you so much for being here and for all of the work that you're doing. I'm really excited to see where you go from here and and the changes that you're going to make. So thank you so much for your time today, Caroline. Thank you. It has been such an honor. Definitely go check out Trapped in Treatment. Um, We've had so much fun today. Thank you so much for having us. Take care, Caroline. Speak to you soon. (laughs) Bye. So some of the the hallmarks, Rebecca, that I had written down included things like inside language, attack and scream therapy, um, 
goon squads taking people in the middle of the night. Um, it, 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 goons is the word that, that has, I think, been applied to people that, that run those services by survivors of the industry themselves. Um, strip searches, isolation, no personal belongings allowed, manual labor, horrific living conditions without basic necessities provided like hot showers or balanced meals. Is there anything else that you've come across that might indicate like a, a hallmark of a, of a troubled teen program that, that, that Caroline didn't mention? Mm -hmm. I really think she got it all. Um, and you, you described the goons in the night. I, I use the term transport industry and transport experience. That's a big one for sure, because, you know, they're, these teens are starting off their treatment experience with one of the most traumatizing experiences that they have is that they're supposed to feel safe within their own bed, within their own home. And they're generally taken from their bed in the middle of the night by strangers. And so that creates just this immediate trauma um, alongside just lack of distrust for any adult figure that's in your life. And much like we spoke about before with the parents being told uh, not to communicate with their, their children for a certain amount of time when they enter the programs, they are almost trained on, on how to react to these middle of the night situations as well in terms of not making eye contact with your child, don't answer your child's questions, um, allow us to kind of take, take direction on, on everything. Um, and uh, one thing that was interesting about that, that particular segment in Trapped in Treatment around the transport services in episode two was that the, 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 the woman that speaks about her particular services, first of all, she said they were a Christian based service, which I thought was interested in itself. But secondly, she mentioned that they mm -hmm. work with another organization uh, to train their staff or agents, as she called them, on how to correctly apprehend somebody or contain a person for their own safety and the safety of the agents involved. Um, and that to me stuck out because they're not only talking about restraining a person, you know, you, you've also mentioned that there is the use of zip ties and handcuffs um, or sometimes even rope. Um, so even though the, 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 the restraints are being used and the staff have been trained on how to use them uh, air quotes appropriately uh, there's also the the fact that she mentioned using another organization to train the staff and that led me to thinking about all the organizations that are involved in making this industry a billion dollar industry so you've talked mm -hmm. about how some social workers might place kids in these institutions because of the foster system uh, but I wondered if there were any other in, in institutions or agencies involved that kind of work together to network this industry into what it is today. Um, uh, you kind of speak about it in the Trapped in Treatment podcast itself, and we've spoken about it a lot on the show, but it'd be great to hear it from your perspective on what you've you found. Sure. So there's so there are so many organizations that touch this industry. So yes, a child welfare, certainly with foster youth, they're placing foster youth in these institutions as a means of housing. Uh, the juvenile justice system is placing youth in these facilities. Um, they're, they often, you know, judges think of this as the least restrictive option because there's not enough, not enough awareness and education that gets to them about what is actually happening in these facilities. In addition, school districts are placing youth in these facilities. In, if um, you know a youth is on an IEP placement, individualized education placement, um, the parent or the school district can recommend that the school district place the child in a residential facility if their educational needs are not being met within the local public school. We've also most recently found that migrant youth are being placed in these facilities. They're being taken from the border. There are federal contracts with facilities and parent companies like Devereaux, where youth are separated from their families and they are going directly into this industry and they could experience up to 10 placements oh within goodness. a year's time. And then of course there are parents who are placing kids. There are mental health providers who believe that this is the best option. So the list kind of goes on and on. I mean, the additional, the additional ways are really through education consultants who are hired by parents. And often we've found, you know, 
based on court cases and, and other ways have figured out that they often receive kickbacks from the facilities that they send youth to. So there's a lot of various pipelines into these types of programs um, and education and awareness needs to get to all of those pipelines, which is, is what we're trying to do. Mm -hmm. I think I've linked it to Big Pharma quite a lot in oh, the, yeah. the in the previous episodes that we've done in the way that a, a lot of different industries will kind of work together to to make uh, big pharma the profits that it gets mm -hmm. and and this kind of feels the same and I'm sure mm -hmm. that there are pharmaceutical companies that are involved in the trouble teen industry well because they're well. medicating they're medicating the kids so 100 yeah I mean when and then right so you don't just talk about the pipeline you talk about the government agencies that oversee it so in the podcast we talk a lot about the joint commission please listen to that episode it is shocking the joint commission is there to accredit these organizations, pe people who don't understand it. It's kind of like dolphin safe. If you've seen anything about that, it's like, okay, you can put the stamp of approval on it, but you have no idea if dolphins are actually safe, uh, you know, when they're fishing and, and doing all that type of thing. It's the same with the Joint Commission. It is a sticker. That is all. These, the, you know, the Joint Commission they do not go out to the facilities. Um, they give them corrective plans of actions sometimes, but they rarely take back accreditation if a facility is actually found to be abusing and neglecting children. So the Joint Commission accredits Provo Canyon School. And as you watch this, you know, as you listen to this podcast, you will obviously find out that all of the things that are happening within the facility are not legal um, and they're very detrimental, yet the Joint Commission continues to accredit them for the last 50 mm -hmm. years. And that's the same for Office of Licensing within states, governors, you know, there's a, there's a lot of accountability that needs to happen uh, to make this, this industry better. And that, it feels almost like we see with um, multi-level marketing businesses that have like a yes. Bureau of yes. Trading well, sticker or a, or a best-selling business sticker. And we didn't get into this in, in the podcast, but Ken Stetler, who was the director of the Office of Licensing in Utah, went directly from that job to being one of the executive directors of Provo Canyon School for a while. So there is this very interesting interweaving of government and facilities. And, you know, I could go on and on and explain some of the other political issues there, but like, that's, that's just one example of many. That is so unethical. It's like over here when the government were given, uh, it was like a, um, a, a ludicrous amount of money, a contract for somebody to develop the, the track and trace software for coronavirus over here, where people would have to scan a QR code whether they when they entered a, a, any kind of public premises, like a coffee shop or a restaurant or, uh, or anything like that. They'd have to kind of scan in and provide their email address, which got people a bit annoyed in the first place, like sharing their yeah. public information, like, like we don't have it stolen enough from us anyway. Um, so the, 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 the member of parliament who was um, kind of given the task of finding somebody to undertake that, his oh. name was Dominic yeah. Cummins, and he awarded the contract to his neighbor and everybody was like, how is this ethical? So we see it all the time. And because it happens mm -hmm. so much, it's almost like like I'm laughing about it now and it's not funny. No, it's just so, so obvious. Like, what? Yeah, and we just become so desensitized to, to the people in power that are supposed right. to be looking out for the, the, the best interests of the people that, that they are responsible for in terms of government and policy. That we're just so desensitized to it now that we just laugh and that's not the right attitude to have but sometimes it's like what else can we do but what is so inspiring about this conversation today is that we're not just saying like well what can we do I'm just a small fish in a big pond actually look at the changes that are being made through people coming forward with their stories um, and that kind of leads me nicely into to asking you how is it possible for these programs to exist in the first place? You do talk a little bit about um, that the, the, a lot of them are ungoverned um, in trapped in treatment, but I wondered if you could talk us through um, how 
is it because of the difference in state laws? Um, how is it that, that these programs are able to exist in the first place? Because any sane person from the outside looking in and seeing these things on paper would say, well, surely that's not allowed to, to be a thing. Well, I think everyone is going to have a different opinion. So this is, this is solely my opinion. Um, there are, there are so many complexities to that question. So I think the first is that you know, when this industry was created, it was at a time where we believed behavior modification and that more boot style type uh, treatment was was the answer. And obviously we've come in a significantly long way in society and, and with science to show that that is not the appropriate way to deal with mental health um, and mental health struggles. But the industry has continued to exist and the policies have not changed with it. So really we're seeing the same exact treatment back in the 1960s that today we, we think is wildly inappropriate, but there aren't policies in place to correct that. And there's not databases or transparency so that we can really fully question what's happening in the facilities. So the information that we have is from public record requests that we do that are expensive a lot of the time and they're, they're time sensitive. Um, you know, we hear directly from survivors, but if you are someone, you know, in a, in a random state that is just interested in this issue, there's very little way to find out what is actually happening in the facility that is in your backyard. Um, and that again is what Caroline is working to create with that database. We are trying to create this level, level of transparency that's never existed. And that is really what has fueled this industry is that government is not touching this issue because you know some of them, like we just talked about, have their own interweavings with it. Um, a, lot, a, a lot of government officials have no idea what is going on because we believe the Joint Commission you know, has the authority to accredit and discredit facilities that are bad, but they are not doing their job. Um, but, you know, the government has relied on them to do that. And so there's so many different reasons why, but I would say the lack of transparency um, and the lack of believing survivors for so long um, and not taking action when they do come forward bravely has really enabled this industri industry to exist. And that is what we are working to change with the Accountability for Congregate Care Act is that we are looking for that accountability, that transparency mechanism where facilities will have to report what happens within the facilities and then a corrective you know, plan of action, whether that be shutting the facility down or, or whatnot can finally be taken. What are other steps that survivors and allies can take to continue bringing awareness to this industry, to continue keeping the, the momentum going and, and adding to, to, to what's already been put in place? Yeah, well, everyone, I mean, everyone has the opportunity to email their senator and their representatives within their state. They'd love to hear from their own constituents. That's the best um, and most appropriate way to get your, your views across. So reach out to them, share your stories. We are also working on placing op-eds across the United States on the date of the introduction. So if you're interested in placing an op-ed with us and sharing your experience with this industry, please reach out to us at this is Paris at ParisHiltonEntertainment.com and we will work with you on that. Um, and just continue to raise awareness in your social media. I mean, change can happen at a minute as well as the macro level. Um, and so whether it's it's within your own community, it's with your own family, uh, it's with your university, or it's you know at a government level, everything matters. To kind of build on, on that, which is there are some great things there that, that, that even, you know, if you're listening to this podcast, the chances are that you have kind of um, limited or unlimited access to the internet. So um, if you use social media, then there is a way to, 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 to ally with and, and be involved in this movement, which I think is so fantastic, but also just going to watch Paris Hilton's documentary on YouTube to, and, and going to listen to Trapped in Treatment and educating ourselves to understand the industry a bit better to go back through this podcast and listen to survivor testimonies and, and real things that have happened. But, but uh, there is a way for all sorts of people to be involved. I know Breaking Code Silence, they have, um, they have places that you can donate to and it, it, there's a very uh, uh, meticulous breakdown on what that money is spent on and, and how your donations will be used to further the efforts. 
Um, I've seen some people sporting some unsilenced t-shirts. So there's, there's lots of different ways that you can support. It doesn't always have to be financial. Um, and I think that's exciting and accessible and, and just any average Joe can be involved in, in making change. Um, mm -hmm. But to build on that, what advice would you have for people that have experienced this industry firsthand to those survivors that, that, that want their voices to be heard for themselves to become unsilenced? Where would you recommend them going to provide their testimonies, their stories, um, and how can, how can they make sure that their experience does not go unheard? So there's a lot of survivor Facebook groups um, that are more generalized, the troubled teen industry, as well as facility-based. So I would say look there. I know if Caroline was still on, she would say go to Unsilenced because they you know, are all a community of survivors that are working to advocate against the troubled teen industry and, and the negative effects of it. Um, and of course, you're more than welcome to come to Paris Hilton and to me um, to tell your story there. And, and that would be via that email that we've already provided on this podcast. Um, and as I mentioned there, there's, there's, there's the Breaking Code website, uh, Breaking Code Silence website, there's the, the uh, Unsilenced Now Instagram account that we've talked about, there's a Trapped in Treatment website, there's the Trapped in Treatment podcast. Um, one thing I did want to ask Caroline that I didn't um, think to ask her before she left was, that there is a co another co-CEO of Unsilenced and I believe her name is Meg and I wondered if you could just tell us a little bit about Meg. Meg is also a survivor of the industry and she's working with Caroline. Um, I, her bio is definitely on the website and the two of them are read readily available so I would just say go to Unsilenced. Let me make sure I have that right. It says I think it's unsilenced.org here. Yeah. So I would say go to unsilenced.org and there are plenty of ways to meet the two of them and see what they're up to. So I, I guess all that there is left to say now uh, is thank you so much for your time, Rebecca. We've gone through a few things. There's just a whole mountain of, of, of things that we could discuss. And I always say that every single episode that I do on the show, even though the interviews are two to three hours, it's always like, this is just the tip of the iceberg or this is just scratching the surface. And I feel like I need that on a t-shirt um, or a mug <laughs> or something because it, it, it goes so deep and, and it, we could talk about all the testimonies on this podcast and we could talk about all of the episodes that are already released and that will be released in the future of Trapped in Treatment. And we could talk about all of the, the stories that have come through on Breaking Code Silence. And we could talk about all of the other podcasts and pieces of media that exist where people are coming forward with their stories. And we could link it all together into some complex mind map and we would still have never even scratched the surface of this entire situation, this entire industry. Um, and, and that is mind boggling that, that there's no way to clearly describe or lay out all of the intrinsic things that are involved. The, the things that we do know is that there needs to be change against the institutionalized abuse of children that has been happening for decades and is still happening today within and outside of the United States of America. And the change is happening and it is here today and people can get involved and they can contribute. And it's incredibly exciting and empowering to know that that time is now and everybody's story is prevalent and important and can make change no matter how insignificant they feel it may be or may have been at the time that's not the case. Um, every single person's story is, in, as, is, is just as important as the next. And, and now is the time for those people to come forward and, and have their voices heard. And I think that the work that you are doing along with Caroline and Paris Hilton and the entire team 
around trapped in treatment and all the, the, the fantastic collaboration that there is with um, Warner Brothers Unscripted TV and iHeartRadio and all of the all of the places that are coming together, all of the studios that are coming together to make this work possible is absolutely fantastic. I think anybody that hears your podcast Trapped in Treatment is not going to be able to sit idly by knowing that this is happening to, to children uh, all, all over the world. Um, and uh, and I think that the advocacy work that is happening is is just uh, is so honourable and much needed and um, and should have happened years ago, but perhaps the right voices weren't around. And I wanted to say this to Caroline while she was here, but she was, and this is, I feel like quite poignant, but she was told that she wasn't allowed to speak in her programme. And now mm -hmm. there is nobody to stop her from speaking. And she is going to make sure that she is heard along with all of the voices of the other survivors that come forward. And I think that's pretty incredible in itself. So thank you Absolutely. so much for, for the work that you're doing and for coming and, and sitting with me today. Um, and please let everybody know where they can find your podcast, Trapped in Treatment. Trapped in Treatment is available wherever you get your podcast, most likely where you're listening right now. That includes the iHeartRadio app, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, our website, trappedintreatment.com. Uh, the list goes on and on. I would also recommend following Paris Hilton on all social media as you'll continue to get updates both on the podcast as well as all the other advocacy work we're doing. We put all of our calls to action for general audience as well as people who have been impacted by this industry uh, via her Twitter, her Instagram, as well as her Facebook. So please connect with us there. That's fantastic, Rebecca. Thank you so much for your time today. And I hope you enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. You too. And thank you for giving us this opportunity. Your podcast is equally as important to raising awareness and, and creating that change that we need. So thank you. It's an absolute privilege of mine. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thank you. Bye. Bye. That is the end of this week's episode. If you'd like to get in touch, you can email me at coltvoltpodcast at gmail.com or follow me on Twitter and Instagram at coltvoltpod. I'm your speaker, Casey, and this has been The Colt Vault.